So I'll, I'll try and be brief. What I want to share with you are some insights. And I'm going to go a little bit beyond where we've been so far at this conference. I think we've had a wonderful almost two days worth of talking about getting drugs um, me, approved, getting them registered, uh, getting them to approval, and getting them to market. But we ha really haven't spent much time about what happens then. So I'm going to share with you some insights. I've been working in the rare disease community for, gosh, almost 25 years now. I age myself. And most of my experience has been with ultra-orphan disorders. Now, I'm going to share with you some information. It's mostly US, although the model that I'm going to close with and the case study I'll close with, <coughs> we believe has um, EU and rest of world applications with some modifications for how drugs are delivered outside of the US. What I'll say to you is that I've, I thank God every day that I'm, I've had an opportunity to work in the ultra-orphan space. And it's, it's probably one of the most rewarding careers I think we could have because what we're doing literally saves lives. It makes such a difference. And when you get close to the patients and when you listen and, and you sit with them and understand the impact of these innovative products, it's, it's tremendous. And so I think, you know, when my days are done, you know, and I hopefully go to heaven, it'll, it'll be because I was able to help so many people in this space. So let's talk about ultra-orphan. Ultra-orphan is small. We've always defined it as fewer than 20,000 patients. So what I'll tell you is that of the six to 7,000 rare diseases that we've talked about um, being on that list, almost 80% of those affect fewer than 6,000 patients. So by default, when we're looking at orphan or rare diseases, we're talking about ultra-orphan diseases. So what I'm going to share with you again is a little bit about the marketplace and then a model that we think you might want to consider as you're planning your life cycle of your product, not just getting it to marketplace. So we've talked about the advantages. Um, data shows us, at least in the US marketplace, that it takes a, a year to two years less to bring an orphan drug to the market than it does for a commercial drug. Um, there are better odds for approval. I think we heard a, a good um, story of kind of the other side. But uh, Bernstein Research just came out with some information recently, and they looked at 10 orphan disease states, which had 18 drugs approved in them, and looked at the success rates for drugs in those 10 disease states. And it was 84% from phase two forward. And that contrasts against 35% success rate in a normal drug in phase two to market, and I think 65% phase three forward. So there is a better odds of success for that. Profitability. We all know that there's a good business model so far with orphan drugs. And it's for a couple of reasons. We know that pricing can be at a premium because of the small market size. But our cost structure associated with serving these markets is much less, right? You don't need a huge sales force to go out and call on 10 or 15 KOLs that are, that are going to write 85 to 90 percent of your scripts. So you really don't need a huge infrastructure to support therapies for a few hundred or a few thousand patients. The, um, Ongoing revenue growth due to steady uptake. Again, what we see is that patients, typically in this space, have a lifetime economic value that far exceeds that of a, of a patient on a, uh, just a normal chronic med. So when we look at our economic models, we're seeing that these are sort of annuity patients, right? We, we are going to have them for their lifetime, or hopefully until a cure is found. So these are long lifetime um, products. So, Thus, we do have a longer product life cycle to think about. And there is a competitive advantage to being first in market, because if you are the innovator, you're the first one to bring a, an effective product to a rare disease marketplace, you have the opportunity to build a brand and build a loyalty in that marketplace. And it's hard to displace that. And, I'll, and again, my case study at the end really is a case in point about how that works. On average, it costs less, obviously, to bring these products to marketplace because clinical trials are smaller. Uh, on average, again, um, from that same report that I referenced, it looks like somewhere between 75 and $150 million to bring an orphan drug to the marketplace. What else is happening? Well, we just talked about big pharma, small markets. Now, it's interesting because if you talk with our friends at Pfizer and GSK and others, they've been in the rare disease marketplace for a long time. 
we just really didn't think about it, right? Well, what happened a couple years ago? Santa Fe said, we want to buy Genzyme. Everyone's like, wow. About the same time, Pfizer announced a deal um, with a, a company from Israel to provide a lysosomal storage disorder product. And all of a sudden, people are standing back and saying, well, wait a minute. Two of the largest pharmaceutical manufacturers in the world are entering the smallest world or are going to fight it out in one of the world's smallest marketplaces. And how do you gain market share? One patient at a time. And that sort of sums up what I, what I think you have to think about as you start to think about commercializing and supporting your product over life cycle. These marketplaces are built one patient at a time. But as I said, Big Pharma has been around for quite a while. In fact, in 2009, 43% of the orphan approvals in the US um, were Big Pharma. And about 70% of the orphan marketplace belongs to Big Pharma. So Big Pharma has been there. It's just that we didn't really think about it. And I think Big Pharma has made some very um, strategic moves, um, acquisitions, formations of rare disease units, bringing more focus, more expertise, and understanding of rare disease markets, and bringing it to the forefront and investing in it. What are the challenges? Well, we've talked about the challenges, right? Biggest thing is how do you find patients? When there's a few hundred patients, and you need to do a clinical trial, how do you find them? That's where registries are, are so important. And I, I can't emphasize again as a community, as an industry, we need to figure out this registry issue and how to share information because it makes no sense if you think about it. Let's say there are a thousand patients in the world with a rare disorder and we've got four or five manufacturers in the pipeline. Let's talk about hereditary angioedema, for example. There are now four drugs out there for you know, patient populations of fewer than 20,000. If you split them up into four or five registries, how does that really help? How does that help you? How does that help the community? So we really do need to figure that out. The good news is that if you get actively involved in that, finding patients is a whole lot easier because the community will find them for you. The clinical trials, as we know, are unique. And I, I think it's, in the last four years, I've seen a tremendous amount of progress being made, um, at least in the US with the FDA, looking at you know, surrogate endpoints, looking at biomarkers, um, you know, really trying to identify what is an appropriate endpoint for a rare disease where you can only study 30 or 40 patients and your product maybe is disease modifying. It's not a cure, and it's something that over the lifetime of a child is expected to have an impact, but you're not gonna see it for a few years. So those are the kind of conversations that need to continue, but I think science is gonna help us out here. We, we certainly see the impact of genetic testing. Um, we're seeing the impact of new technologies. I look at um, uh, you know, lung disorders and, and you know, using uh, CT now as, an, as a way to look at whether or not alpha-1 antitrypsin protein is actually um, halting the progression of the disease. Um, so there are pro, you know, progress and, and some things, I think, moving forward on that front. We've talked about policy and regulatory issues. And I think um, our, our previous panelists did a good job of kind of highlighting some of the struggles you have here in the EU. In the US, you know, we've got good news, bad news. Um, the FDA was granted a few years ago some authority to do things called RIMS, Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategies, which are constraints that they can put on the distribution of a drug and the amount of data you have to collect and follow. But if you have a REMS, it's more likely that you'll get approval. And uh, just you know, on the way over here was reading about some uh, new legislation that's being proposed as part of FDA's new funding that will have to do with progressive approval, progressive pathway approval. And again, it mentions REMS as a tool, whereby if you show your drug is safe and there's a reasonable expectation of clinical efficacy, they can use REMS to say, we'll limit it, to who you can serve, we'll give you a progressive pathway, we'll give you a, 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 an approval, but you're gonna have to follow it very closely, you're gonna have to give us this data, we're gonna look for the first sign of a problem, you're gonna have to collect more, better outcomes data. And, and that impacts the way you think about your commercialization. 
So that's some of the sort of the, the other edge of the sword, I guess, that goes with this. And finally, I think we've talked about this a lot, is the changing reimbursement environment. And my message here is, as an industry, we have to change the discussion from one of price to one of value. And if we get caught in the price discussion, and you know, in the, in the US, we've had huge discussions over the last three years about reforming our healthcare system. And many, many times, we're seeing people say, wait a minute, why should my state Medicaid program pay $150,000 for one patient for one year when I could spend $1,000 on 150 patients for a year? I have to do the greatest good for society. Why should we do that? And what I will tell you, at least in the US, that's really the wrong conversation to be having. Because we decided years ago, when we passed the Drug Act, that it was, society, it was the mission of society to take care of these people. These truly are the people who lost the genetic lottery. And as a society, we decided to incentivize and grow uh, treatments and therapies to help these individuals. So I, I hate to see us go back to a discussion around price. So let's talk about value. And I think that is, that is a common ground that everyone can talk about. We've talked a little bit about it. And again, I'm going to show you how that influences your thinking around building your commercial models. So our goal is to align the incentives in your channel to drive lifetime economic value. Because if you think about it, again, these patients are there for a lifetime. Now, what does that mean? I think most of us in the room here, or, or most of you, probably have a little more experience and, and focus on the development side and getting the drug through the approval pathway, through the clinical trials, the data. How many of you are really involved in the commercialization? Not a lot, maybe 15 to 20%. So what I'm going to tell you is those of you who are not involved in commercialization need to go back and call up your commercial people and you all need to get around the same table and start talking about your drug because an effective strategy for bringing your product to market and managing a long life cycle starts with the clinical trials and the data that you're collecting, the natural history registries, and I'll, I'll go so far as to say you're going to need to start building in pharmacoeconomics and lifetime economics into your clinical trials. And pre be prepared to have that data to not only present to the authority, but certainly to present to the payers when your product is approved. Because that's the discussion that's, that's going to happen. The other thing that you need to do in thinking through this and bringing your team together is to think about what happens post-approval. And how can I continue to illustrate and prove the value of my product ongoing. Because we might have a, a, you know, a progressive approval pathway. We certainly are going to have to defend our price. And it's not like it's, you're going to get it on the market, and the market's going to accept $250,000 per patient per year. And in three years, you're not going to get pressure from payers. right? Has anybody really seen those prices go up once you set them? I know it doesn't happen too much in the EU. We get a little bit of inflation in the US around our, our orphan drug prices. So that's why I'm challenging you to think about a long-term model that's not segregated into development, um, you know, uh, bringing it to market, and then post-market. Bring it all into one focus. So what I'm going to do um, is kind of walk you through how one client that I've worked with for a number of years have, has done this. And maybe there's some learnings here, I think, for all of us. The first message is that it starts with a thorough understanding of the implications of the disease you're working with. From what I've heard over the last day and a half, I think that's something everybody's pretty keen to. But let's see if you're really looking at the things that matter, OK? So we know we're looking at endpoints. We know we're looking at whether or not the therapy produces um, positive results. But how many of you are thinking about the whole disease burden? How many of you are thinking about the psychosocial impact of the disorder that you serve? How many of you are thinking about how the patients feel and, and how to motivate and drive behavior once they're on your product? Comorbidities? Is anybody looking at comorbidities? 
And do you have an opportunity when you start interacting with these patients to impact more than just the therapeutic value of your drug? And I would subject that you do because there's a lot of opportunity. The, the beautiful thing about working in this orphan and ultra-orphan marketplace is that you get to be really close to your marketplace, right? One patient at a time, one life at a time. And when you have that kind of an intense, intimate relationship with your marketplace, you can do a lot of good if you think outside the box. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share an example of somebody who thought outside the box. Um, a number of years ago, a, a biological <laughs> manufacturer in the US at the time, it was Cutter Miles, and it was Bayer, and then uh, it's, now, it's now rolled up into a company called Griffles, which is a Spanish company here. Um, brought out one of the first orphan drugs, actually, to be approved in the US. It's called Prolastin. It's a protein replacement product for people with a genetic disorder called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. They struggled um, being the only provider in the marketplace. They had some limitations on production. They had a, a strained relationship with the patient community because at the time they had the big pharma model and that basically was we'll produce it, we'll dump it into the channels, go to the channels and get the drug. And because there were shortages, because it was a drug with some complexity, it was expensive, um, it created a sort of a bad relationship between the patient community and the manufacturer. So in 1999, the manufacturer decided to try something different. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be working with them and the patient organization on a project which actually withdrew the drug from the normal marketplace and relaunched it into a, a patient-centered health model. And I'm going to go through the attributes of that, and I'll share the outcomes of that. But basically, what the idea was was to really wrap the patient with a total group of services that included their drug, but didn't stop at their drug, with an, with an attempt to build a brand, build a relationship, and help them lead better lives with their disorder. All right? So what did that look like? Well, first, what they did was go to an, what we call an integrated exclusive model. They chose one provider in the United States, okay? And that provider provided all of the services that were going to be required to support um, these individuals. So let's take a look at what those services looked like. They started with a, a simple third-party logistics wholesale um, type of support. So all the product was shipped from the manufacturing plant into the, the uh, provider. Um, then a customer service team was built with reimbursement expertise. Um, with case management expertise to help patients navigate the reimbursement hurdles, to navigate the coordination hurdles of getting on the product. They used that same provider then to be both the wholesaler and the specialty pharmacy. So all patients were served by one provider. Now this gave them the opportunity to learn things about their marketplace they never knew before. So they brought together about 2,000 patients at the time um, into one model and started providing support services that went beyond just the therapeutic value. Some of that included nursing. Um, it, is pro it is an infused product, so they provided um, through this provider the nursing, lab draws, education, training, those types of things, building a relationship. What was probably most interesting about the model was that they engaged with the patient community to develop a meaningful health management program which was not built around the therapy, but rather built around best practices for living with the disease alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Then they hired and trained 26 individuals with alpha-1 to administer the program on a go-forward basis. And to this day, those 26 alpha-1 coordinators, is what they're called, maintain a relationship with better than 2,700 patients now. It's grown to that point. Um, so I'm going to share with you some of the results of what they did as a result of this health management approach. Now, I'll back up and tell you, you know, for those of us in the industry, we're looking at, at outcomes. The program generates phenomenal performance, 97% compliance last year to therapy. So the patients, those 2,700 patients, took their product 97% of the time, okay, which is pretty phenomenal compliance data. 96% loyalty. 96% of the patients stay with, stay with the patient, or stay with the program over and over. Um, what they did here was actually do a benchmark. So we took the one year, 
just benchmark patients, followed some outcomes, then implemented the health management program that I mentioned to you to see if we could make a difference. And what you see here is that there was a statistical difference in hospital admissions, in ER visits, MD visits, antibiotic days. Um, exacerbations were one of the things that we looked at to try and change through education, helping patients understand when they were getting an exacerbation and how to get it treated early so that they didn't need to go into the hospital. So we saw a 10% reduction in exacerbations. Um, primary care physician visits, unscheduled physician visits, ER visits, hospitalizations. So the point of sharing this with you is that the, this manufacturer thought outside the box, right? They did more than just get their drug to the patient and sell drugs. They created a complete support system, a health management system, engaged with people to help them lead better, healthier, more productive lives, measured the outcome. Now, what do you think they've done with this data? There are now three competitors in the marketplace to this drug. There's three competitors have been in the market. Two of them have been in the market for over five years. Uh, the, the third one just came into the market last year. These guys have continued to grow their market share and currently have about 70% market share. So remember when I said to you there's an advantage to being first in if you do it right? These guys have built a model that has effectively created a barrier to competition the other products are great products. They work, as far as we can tell, just as well. The difference is in the program. So I'll leave that with you, um, answer a question or two if I can, and hope that maybe I've shared something of interest with you. Thank you.